Hello and welcome to Center Ice Cardcast, your one-stop podcast shop for all things hockey cards. My name is Eric Andrews, also known in the hobby as Hammerhawks, and I'm joined by my co-host and fellow hobbyist Aaron Goldstein, better known as Crease Collector. So typically we don't share our pickups super frequently, but I think this package that I got today deserves the attention. So we're going to kick off the episode with a pretty big time mail day for myself. So just a little bit of context on the package. This is my end of a trade made on Facebook, and I had to give up two pretty sweet cards to a Vegas Golden Knights collector in order to get this card. I ended up giving up a Stature Auto Patch out of nine of Cody Glass and an Ultimate Collection Icons Auto Patch out of 25 of Marc-Andre Fleury. So definitely two pretty sweet cards that that collector will be getting for his collection. But yeah, I'm definitely excited about this card that I got. And Aaron and I have been talking about this, but this is like the strangest packaging job I think I've ever seen. I know you guys can't see the package that I'm holding right now, but it's literally as if it's just like a sheet of bubble wrap that the guy folded in half and like glued together. I've never seen anyone do this before. We kind of made the joke that it's like the Uncrustables version of a bubble mailer. Yeah, it's strange. Like you can probably upload some of the pictures you send me. Yeah, you that's know, People true. really want to take a look at it. It's, it's just, it's so bizarre. Yeah, it really is. And yeah, that's a good idea. I can do that for sure. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's well protected or at least protected enough. I don't see any noticeable damage or anything. But yeah, I I have never seen a package like this. So I'm just, I was surprised when I saw it in the mailbox. But yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and cut into it here. Almost never just straight up cut bubble mailers in half. But I think that's really the only way of doing it for this one. And I still can't get into it. It's almost like airtight, almost. I know, it really is. Like, that's pretty much what it is. So I'm having to destroy this thing. Jeez, I kind of cut into the top loader a little bit, but it's okay. And as a little hint to a future episode, we do plan on talking about how to package cards well in order for shipping. Yeah, luckily this seems to be okay, even though I totally did just cut into the top loader, but it did not get to the card. All right, so I finally got the card out, and it is a pretty one for sure. Aaron and I are on a video chat right now, so Aaron can see the card. I'll end up editing in a scan of it so you guys can see it, at least on YouTube, and I'll probably post a picture on social media as well. But the card is a 2019-20 SP Authentic Future Watch inscribed number 28 out of 999 of Jack Hughes. That's awesome. And for those who don't know, the inscribed versions uh, with their NHL debut is just out of 50 copies. So the first 50 were signed with their uh, debut day, and then the rest were just signed. So um, that is, that's awesome. That is a great card. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, for those curious, um, I definitely did pick it up with the intention of it being available. Yeah, definitely a sweet card. Um, not every day that at least that I'm getting, you know, cards worth hundreds of dollars. So uh, definitely a fun little package to start off today's episode with. I've always really enjoyed the uh, the Future Watch autographs with the dates on them, the, the NHL debut dates out of 50. I think that was a really good idea that Upper Deck did. They, they started that a couple of years ago. And I've always thought that was a really cool thing. I kind of wish they made it more known that they're out of 50. But other than that, it's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think they're, they're really cool cards just, um, you know, not only to – give another card to chase and a rarer version of the card to chase but also in some ways it's just kind of documenting history of the game you know yeah. I mean, not every single player necessarily had a, a crazy iconic debut or anything but i mean i immediately think of austin matthews with his four goal game in his nhl debut and that you know his inscribed future watch documents that game that's true that's a good point so, yeah, they're definitely cool cards. Um, I have only owned one of these before, obviously not of Jack Hughes, just of a different player, but don't still have that one anymore. But, uh, yeah, they're definitely cool cards. Just, you know, nice to see something a little bit different than just, you know, your everyday autograph card. So, yeah, and obviously with them being rarer and more desirable, the value on them is definitely a lot higher than just the normal future watch that theoretically is numbered out of 949 since the inscribed version are out of 50 even though they're all within the same 999 print run but 
yeah, definitely a sweet card and uh, hoping that I can find a good home f- for this one down the road. Absolutely. Uh, and then now we're just going to touch on to uh, just our next topic, which is a brief review of uh, 1920 Upper Deck Ultimate. And uh, just our first impressions on it here is that I really felt that the base designs this year were really nice, uh, very clean. Uh, the Ultimate Icon set that was continued on from last season is also in there as well. So those uh, who don't know, um, the Ultimate Icon set first appeared last year, I believe. And so it's nice to see them continue it on this year. I've always thought those cards were really great looking. Eric, I know you're kind of torn a little bit on them, but for me, I've always really liked them. The Ultimate Horizontal RPAs have a really sharp design as well. And the Ultimate Access cards, um, they've really improved them from last season, I think. And the the overall design, as well as the great action photo, just really kind of makes these cards like something special. Like for me, as soon as I saw these access cards, it kind of, for me, reminded me of the um, the Upper Deck Canvas cards in that the photography used on the card was kind of like next level from, you know, just your standard base card or something like that. Like that. So that just really stuck out to me. I saw a Henrik Lundqvist today, and it really just, it really popped just that that photo that they used for him so it's nice to see the ultimate access cards in there again um again with just a improved design that was very very nice as well the ultimate introductions uh those cards kind of threw me for a loop as soon as i first kind of saw them they they have a um a very highly edited like almost ghost-like photo on the card so you kind of have to like do a double take when you see one of these things and um they have kind of like a, a sharp marble kind of borders. So when you first look at these cards, um, they definitely, definitely stand out. So that has been a nice change for sure. Um, and just a new insert that we just want to touch on. It's the Pro Threads autographed memorabilia cards. Um, it's just there to complement the um, debut threads, which have been a staple in Ultimate for many years now. And just another new answer we want to talk about is the Rookie Accents autographs. Uh, they feature a monochromatic uh, base of the team's primary color. So it's always nice to see when cards can not only look nice, obviously, but um, kind of mesh the autograph with the card itself. So. Um, yeah, it's always really nice to see when um, Upper Deck can kind of pull one out of their hats there. So, um, yeah, very cool to see there. So that's just our quick uh, rundown of uh, 1920 Upper Deck Ultimate. Yeah, going back to uh, the Icon set, I'm really glad to see that they have continued it on this year with the same design. I, I actually really do like the design itself. You know, we've talked in the past recently about that Flurry Icons card that I mentioned at the yeah, beginning of yeah. the episode. and. I just wasn't super drawn to that card just because of the photo on it that was used. I liked it. I liked it, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's not like that said, it's not, it's not for everybody. So yeah, like I understand. I really like the design of it though. I think just in that specific case, that specific card, the photo kind of left something to be desired, at least for me. But again, that's just me. I love the design of the cards and I'm really glad to see that they are carrying that over exactly the same this year. You know, and again, and probably the main thing about Ultimate that stood out to me was the change in the access cards, like you mentioned, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. Having that focus on a really high quality and interesting action photo just makes the cards look so much better than they did last year. You know, I've seen a few of them so far. I haven't gone. They're great. Haven't gone out of my way to look for them, but they just look awesome. Yeah, like, and also if I can just jump in there, the um. The window for the swatch there, or, or, or the patch, it's um, it, it's very small. So for me, I like I feel it. It brings it back to like the early two thousands or even the nineties, where the, the the window for the memorabilia is so small, which some people might not like that. But for me, I feel like especially on a card like this, it really just brings out the overall design of the card, and it gives the manufacturer a lot more to work with. So I feel like in this case, it's almost better to have that small swatch window. And then again, in this case, especially that card really just pops out with the really nice photography and stuff like that. So definitely very nice cards. Yeah, absolutely. And like you mentioned, the rookie accents, I think are a really great addition as well. Um, You know, I think both Aaron and I are big time suckers for cards that, you know, play off of using the team's colors. So 
you know, having these cards purely based on whatever the team's primary color is just makes the cards look really nice for every single card. You know, a lot of times in a set, just based on the design and the colors used, that design might look better with one team than another. Oh, but, for sure. But if you're using something like this where you're changing it and using the primary color of every single team for the individual cards, it makes every single card in that set look really nice. So I'm really glad to see that they did something like that. I think those are definitely going to be pretty desirable cards. Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been fun to see some of the, the higher-end stuff coming out for the 1920 season. 100%. And, uh, definitely still have some more really nice products still on the docket. But the first 2020-21 product just released this past week, actually, as 2021 MVP was released on August 26th. So obviously, probably the biggest draw, I would say, of MVP is that it's your first chance to grab those cards of the newest rookies. Like usual, that is just focused really on the carryover rookies since the season hasn't started yet. Um, obviously, none of the you know newly drafted players or any, anything like that are live in the product, even though there are uh, divisional redemption cards as well as the first overall draft pick redemption cards that you can pull as well. But uh, yeah, obviously, focusing on those carryover rookies is just a great way to get the new season of products started. One change with that, actually, all of the rookies, as usual, are part of the high series short print part of the checklist, you know, as well as some superstar veterans as well. But Upper Deck actually changed the high series short print design a little bit this year to really make them stand out and make it obvious that, oh, you know, this is something different. This is a short print card. Whereas in years past, they have looked exactly the same as the first 200 cards of the base set. So the only way that you knew, I mean, obviously you knew if you got a rookie card, but as far as a veteran, the only way to know was by looking at the card number and seeing if on the checklist, if it was a, a high series short print or not. But this year, Upper Deck ended up changing the high series short print cards to have a pretty distinguishable green tint to them. And like I said, as soon as you open a pack, you immediately know, oh, there's a high series short print in here. Like you, there's no question, that's what it is. And I really like that change. I think that was a really smart thing to do. Just clear up any you know, misconceptions or um, anything like that and just make it easy for people to, to see right away that, oh, this is a short print card. And then moving along to some of the inserts, uh, yet again, the 20th anniversary retro cards are back. They're based on the 2000-2001 MVP design, and I think they look really, really nice. And uh, those actually come in a, a tiered kind of like parallel subset as well. So there's the base versions that are the third star version, and then it moves on to the second star, which those are numbered out of 100. And then you have the first star versions, which are numbered out of 25. So even just within the retro insert, you have various parallels to collect as well. And I know they did do, um, I think, superscript parallels of them last year, and those were definitely very desirable. But I, I like to see this idea done where there's multiple parallels of that retro inspired set. I think it's just really well done and, and definitely will be desirable cards. And then again, the colors and contours cards are back. And like last year, they mimic that retro style. And another thing to note with those is they actually made them a little bit harder to find um, as far as the parallel versions. So the basic orange color and contour is numbered out of 250. And then the green parallel is numbered out of 20. And then the purple parallels, which I believe last year were numbered out of nine, those ones are numbered out of three this year. So they're even harder to find. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> like I was talking to you yesterday about both those exact same cards because you were searching for one. And just that is definitely a lot more rare than previous years. So good luck with those uh, player collectees searching for those because that uh, that's tough, especially from MVP, you know, uh, notably lower end, so to speak, product. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's an important thing to note too, is that with any really rare cards from a low end product like this, they can be even harder to find than, you know, say a card numbered out of three from something like the cup or something. 
it's, you know, a lot of the times, you know, people either might not realize that, oh, this is a really scarce card, you know, even though it's numbered, they just might not think much of it because it's a low end product or, you know, someone might just open the box and they, you know, just, you know, collect everything from it and don't move it. Or, you know, since it's a low end product, there's probably just not a ton of it being opened, at least maybe not as much as some of the more mid to high end products. So it can just be a lot harder to find those cards. And uh, Billy Celio, our buddy from Upper Deck, who's in charge of MVP, I don't know if he was trying to make it harder on me or what, but uh, Jacob Slavin is included in MVP this year. And he has, of course, the Colors and Contours card. So as soon as I saw that those purple parallels were numbered out of three, I got pretty nervous, you know, just wondering how long it would take for me to even just find one of those cards. But luckily enough, I was able to find and acquire one on eBay on Friday. So luckily uh, that bullet was kind of dodged and I was able to, to pick one up really quickly. So I was pretty excited about that. There's still a few other pretty difficult cards from the product to acquire, but it's good to know that at least the most difficult one is incoming already. So very excited about that. And then one other note on the colors and contours cards as well as just the the 20th anniversary cards in general is the rookie cards actually mimic the 2000 2001 mvp prospects design instead of just using that exact same design from the base set they actually changed it for the rookie cards to mimic those retro rookie cards as well so i think that was just a really nice added touch for that insert set and again that carries over from you know, the third, second, and first star of the retros, as well as all three tiers of the colors and contours cards as well. And then just a couple of changes as far as the insert sets. New this year are the mirror mirror cards and the high speed cards. And those have replaced last year's supernovas and laser shots insert cards. And then uh, like has been done in the last few years, there are some unannounced base variations. So this year, there are All-Star, Winter Classic, Global Series, and Postseason variations. Obviously, that's just for select players on the checklist. Obviously, not every single player played in the All-Star game or the Winter Classic or, you know, what have you. But, uh, yeah, that's just a nice little added chase for, you know, select player collectors to have to pick up those short printed variation cards as well. So, yeah, definitely exciting to you know, see the first new product of the year. It's exciting to see a new crop of rookie cards. Um, Even though there's not necessarily a ton of massive names in the carryover rookies, there are definitely some some names that uh, will definitely have successful careers and will have pretty strong um, hobby collectability, I would say. Just looking through the checklist, um, there are 30 rookie cards, I believe. And to me, the top 10 that stood out were Michael DiPietro of the Vancouver Canucks, Martin Kaut of the Colorado Avalanche, Josh Norris of the Ottawa Senators, Gabe Velarde of the Los Angeles Kings, Timothy Lilligren of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Kiefer Bellows of the New York Islanders, Jake Evans of the Montreal Canadiens, Tyler Benson of the Edmonton Oilers, Liam Foody of the Columbus Blue Jackets, and Jason Robertson of the Dallas Stars. So even though you're not going to be getting those live cards of players like Alexi Lafreniere in MVP. There's still definitely some rookie cards worth picking up just uh, in the live rookies. And like I said, there are still those redemption cards for the divisional rookie packs, as well as the first overall draft pick redemptions. Awesome. Great summary. I really love MVP every year. I mean, I know some people are kind of cold towards it, you know, because it is, you know, a lower end product, but I really love the throwbacks that Upper Deck has been doing the last couple of years, um, especially for a product like MVP, you know. Um, typically, we're seeing now kind of a trend of seeing a lot of throwback designs in, you know, the mid to high-end products, which I personally like, but I know some people are kind of, um, you know, against that whole idea because in a high-end product or even, a, you know, like a middle-of-the-range product and you're paying, um, you know, quite a bit of money, uh, you, you know, as a collector or as a breaker would like to receive, you know, this year's designs, right? And so some people do find it's disappointing to receive a throwback card, but for a product like MVP, I, especially some with some very um, well-known designs from the past, uh, like I really love to see their, those throwback designs every year. So it's good to see that they're continuing it, but also being very in tune with these designs as well. Uh, Eric, you were talking about earlier how they kind of used a different, 
uh, a different throwback design when looking at the regular players versus you know the rookies. So I thought that was very um, a very nice attention to detail there. So it's going to be nice to see some some sweet cards co coming out of MVP this year. And now for our main topic this episode, just pretty much going to touch on is this kids hobby. You know, I say this in quotation marks, still for kids. Um, this topic was originally suggested by Jeremy Lee of Sports Cards Live. When we originally started this podcast, we just kind of sent out a big um, mass uh, post and a couple of people wrote in some questions. And Jeremy Lee was one of the first ones that really, first of all, he's a really big supporter of the podcast. So thanks a lot, Jeremy. But he was one of the ones that first wrote in. And his question was, I would like to hear a segment that addresses the fact that the hobby is still within the reach of kids uh, and not only adults. Like what sets can kids collect and how do you recommend they dip their toes in to get started? So first off, it's a very good uh, topic. It's one that's been discussed to death, uh, you know, on the forums. And I've seen a couple of things on Facebook as well. So it's definitely not a new topic, definitely one that we haven't covered on the podcast yet. So I'm just going to kind of get started here. Uh, as far as like the sets and the kids can collect, uh, one of the big ones is uh, the one we just talked about, and that's MVP. Uh, like we said, it's a, you know, a typically a lower end product. So obviously the price point for a box or a pack is going to be a lot less than say for, you know, Premier or the Cup. So if, if you're, you know, an adult and you're looking for your kids to start collecting, but you don't want to break the bank, uh, this is a way to do it. Or if, you know, if you're a kid, if you're a young viewer watching this, you know, what uh, cards can I go after or what packs or what products should I focus on? MVP is um, is definitely one for you. It definitely gives you a good range of hits. Uh, and again, it's not going to break the bank. So that's a very good option as well. Um, as well as, a, you know, a big product like OPG, where it is the biggest product every year that Upper Deck releases, uh, you know, with the biggest base sets um, and stuff like that. So uh, for someone looking to get into hockey cards, uh, those two products right there are definitely um, ones at the top of your list for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say just as far as how the products are built, MVP and OPG definitely lend themselves more toward kids just as far as the price point really obviously OPG is always known as the set collectors product yeah it's huge but as far as just the the price point and the value within that product it's definitely also very attainable for children to you know collect that product each year another one that it's not um, necessarily just a low end product like an MVP or an OPG but you have to, you know, I, I would consider Upper Deck Series 1 and Series 2 very much to be yeah. kid-friendly, um, especially on the retail level. You know, if you're getting a, a blaster or a retail box or something, you know, retail boxes, generally speaking, of Series 1 and Series 2 can be had for 50 or 60 bucks, depending on the year. And within that, you're going to get six young guns, a jersey card, you know, and all kinds of inserts. So, for that price point, you know, a retail box of Upper Deck 1 or 2 is a pretty, you know, pretty reasonable bet for a kid. You know, I know I have certainly opened my fair share of Upper Deck 1 and 2 retail boxes throughout my childhood. Same. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, it's a great way to get in on, you know, the flagship products that Upper Deck offers every year and still have that potential of hitting something pretty big. I mean, yeah, you're not going to get those hobby exclusive parallels and inserts and things like that that are really worth the big bucks but you know I mean say that back in 2015 a kid bought a box of Upper Deck One retail for you know 55 or 60 bucks and pulled a Connor McDavid Young Gun you know like that's awesome like that's a that's a huge accomplishment for you know really for anybody to pull a card like that but yeah be, I've never pulled a card like that to be able <laughs> to do that as a kid you know and not have broke the bank, you know, is awesome. So I think sometimes those retail products can offer really good value. I think you got to be careful with, with which products, you know, there are some that definitely offer better value than others. And one that has pretty much just been, you know, it's new over the last couple of years is SP retail. I think that's another very, very good product for the price point, especially for kids. You know, the odds of you pulling at least a Jersey card is pretty decent within every single blaster you're not guaranteed one but 
generally speaking, the odds are pretty good you'll get one. And again, you're going to get parallels. You're going to get at least, you know, probably one numbered card, whether that just be an insert or, or a true rookie card from that product. Um, as well as the potential of hitting some pretty rare and valuable autograph cards as well. So I think SP Retail is a really solid product for kids. You know, Upper Deck 1 and 2 you really can't go wrong with. Though at this point I would probably recommend, you know, splurging, so to speak, and getting a full retail box rather than just getting a blaster or even a tin just because the configuration has changed over the last year and the value of the blasters and tins isn't quite as good as it used to be. So I would say that just spending the extra money and getting a full retail box is probably a, a better way to go. You know, and like you said, there's the low end products, both on a retail and a hobby level, like MVP and OPG that offer good value for kids wanting to collect. And then if you're looking more at kind of not necessarily like oddball products, but things that, you know, are more geared toward the accessibility component of it. For years on end, Upper Deck has partnered with, you know, national food chains to create products. And, you know, now over the last number of years, that's been in the form of Tim Hortons each year. So Aaron, you being the Canadian, do you want to talk a little bit more about Tim's? Absolutely. I would love to talk about Tim's. I'm outside of Tim Hortons right now. So um, for those who don't know, uh, I am in Canada. And for the last couple of years, um, we've been doing a Canadian exclusive uh, well, I shouldn't say fully Canadian exclusive, but the main uh, product, I guess I should say, or promotional product, is the Tim Hortons hockey cards. And so, um, like, they're very cheap. I think they're about, uh, with your coffee, I think you can get a pack of uh, three or four cards for about a dollar. So it, it's pretty good value, especially if, you know, you're, you're a kid or, you know, you're, you are an adult, but you're with your kids. Uh, I feel like that is just, the, uh, like, in my opinion like the number one way as far as like getting kids into the hobby and just, um, you know, th they also sell binders there as well. Like, um, you know, to fit all your cards in there and start set collecting. So I feel like just across the board, it's, it's fantastic. Um, it just, a, it's a great way to get a, um, you know, a kid's hobby, as we usually say, like really into the hands of the kids nowadays. I feel like with packs and just boxes it's just getting a little bit out of hand so i feel like um bringing it down to this not even this retail level like, like just this um you know this fast food chain level you know just very very basic you know a place that kids go to a lot um and, and offering hockey cards there is just fantastic like i remember when i was a kid and when mcdonald's made their hockey cards with, with upper deck and that was for me like as a kid like i got into the hobby um, at that time and just I, I remember going to McDonald's and getting you know a couple packs of hockey cards and I was young but you know it's something that I was able to financially do with with very little money and it was it was so fun and, and all your friends around there were um, collecting cards as well you know even if they weren't big collectors you know you, you'd see them picking up a pack or two because it was it was very accessible it was right there so um like those are the kids that aren't gonna spend you know 40 50 dollars retail level but yet they still want to try some hockey cards and so it, it allows collectors like that who maybe aren't even collectors yet really experience the hobby at a very bare bones basic level um and just and just have fun with it and um there is the chance to get some great giveaways um i, I know they did for the past two years i believe they did a Sidney crosby autograph card out of 87 so that is also a big chase card as well as the autograph and uh, jersey cards that are available from Tim Hortons. So those are huge hits. Uh, you see them on eBay, online all the time, even at card shows, and they go for big money. So if you're a kid uh, that hits one of those, um, it's definitely not a bad card to hit uh, once you redeem that redemption. So the Tim Hortons cards, I hope they do it again this year, even with everything going on. But uh, that, that's something that, that is... Um, I'm very happy that Upper Deck brought that back. And also they have partnered with Canadian Tire as well. Uh, kind of like a, a, not a hardware store, but kind of in between. And so they do um, a Canadian Tire coast to coast um, product as well. Um, I believe they branded it OPG. So kind of like a spinoff of, of OPG, um, but they have um, some great chase cards as well, um, as well as some sweet insert 
uh, cards as well, all, all numbered as well. So very, very, um, it looks more like a polished version of say a Tim Hortons. So um, that's been up in the air. Um, I think even last year too, I wasn't sure if they were going to do it, but um, that's another product as well that I love to see. It just, it just for me, for me provides that avenue for collectors who might not even be collecting, you know, um, it just really provides them with a very basic um, understanding of the hobby, but just again, a very basic um, introduction as well. So I feel like for the health and for the strength of this hobby moving forward, I feel like promotional sets like that is very, very um, needed, um, especially if you're the licensed um, manufacturer of NHL hockey cards. I feel like it, it should be written in the contract, like do something like this for kids. Like I'm not sure how long these agreements last between these um, retailers in a sense and Upper Deck, but I'm hoping that they do make ex some extreme efforts to keep that going over the long haul. But um, again, I, th I feel like it's very, um, for the health of this hobby, it's very good long term. So yeah, very, very important stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to Tim's, I mean, even just the, the way that the cards look, like they're really they look nice cool. Cards. They look really good. Really yeah. good. They're really nice cards. The inserts are really nice. You know, I know if I was a kid, you know, I would love cards like the golden etchings and the clear cut. Yeah. Phenoms, yeah. All those. I, they're really cool cards. So it's a very I, small product, but like, like even with the base parallels, they really, in my opinion, they really um, like made it a very well-rounded product. You know, it's only av available for a limited time. And again, it's a small set, but they really rounded it out very well. So again, if you're a kid, it looks very enticing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then as far as some ways for kids to get started or more involved with the hobby, definitely doing things like, you know, going to Tim's and getting a pack of cards. You know, I know in recent years, um, you know, maybe not so much anymore, but, um, you know, people have set up trade nights at Tim Hortons and, you know, made it fun and accessible for kids that way to put together a set or, you know, just collect cards of their favorite players or teams. So things like that are really good. For me, one thing that really, you know, helped drive my passion for the hobby was attending card shows, whether that be something, you know, more on just like a local level at a, at a hotel or something, or, you know, whether it be a national type of card show. Um, you know, I know that uh, Chicago growing up always had a show every single year and then was in the rotation for the national convention as well. So just being able to go to those shows pretty frequently was a really good way for me to, you know, just see how the hobby kind of works on a bigger scale, as well as just have access to a lot of cards that I wouldn't normally have had access to. Growing up, I pretty much would, you know, just get cards from my local card shop before you know, I, I was involved online. I mean, as a kid, you're probably not going to be super involved with the online card community, you know, as you're starting to get into maybe a teenager in high school and things like that, then yeah, you probably will. But, you know, as a little kid, you're kind of just excited about any possible way that you can be around cards. So being at card shows, I think is, a, is really probably the best way of doing that. Aaron, what do you think about that? Oh, 100%. I mean, obviously now with today's environment, um, it's going to be kind of hard. I'm not sure when the next uh, card show is going to be, but I'm definitely having, you know, small local shows. I know there's a lot here in the Toronto area. And of course, you know, the big one, the Expo, the Toronto Expo, those shows like that are a great way to get involved as well. I went to a couple as well when I was a kid. And so again, just for the health and growth of this hobby, again, um, to your point, Eric, about uh, not really... I mean, they have internet access, of course, but uh, for, for a kid to join a, a hobby board, for example, um, might be kind of too out of reach for them at that point. So having small local shows are just really good for the hobby and really good for kids to just kind of look around um, with any kind of budget, uh, low or high, and to get um, that full experience of the hobby. I think that's really, really important. And it's definitely great to see. And as far as our own personal experiences go, I think all these um, initiatives that we've mentioned have not only helped, but kind of inspired our continuation in the hobby as well, like, like growing up. Like we're adults now, but it's definitely helped a lot growing up. 
And then for starting your collection, like you, if you're a kid listening to this podcast um, and you want to kind of get your your feet wet a little bit for, um, you know, for starting up this this new hobby of yours. When starting out, like especially if you do know some collectors involved, like maybe even your your mom or dad, free stuff is always really good to start out with. Um, it might not be much, but free is always good. And at least um, maybe it's some base cards or some inserts cards, or even, you know, you get something on Halloween. I typically do give out cards every Halloween, uh, just some, uh, you know, a couple base cards, like maybe some inserts. So like if you are a, a, a kid who do receive some free cards, um, take it, you know, it's free and it's definitely a good start as well. Um, if you are uh, serious about spending a little bit more money in this hobby, uh, like any hobby, just have a budget and stick to it. You know, try not to go over your budget too much. Otherwise, you know, your parents might not be too excited about that. And yourself, it, it kind of might deter you from continuing because if you spend a whole lot of money at the start and don't really end up with much, or if you're trying to worry about values too much, you might kind of get discouraged a little bit. So just have a nice light budget to start and just have fun with it. This kind of goes with budgets, but just set a realistic goal when starting out your collection. Um, because if you do have other people around you who are in the hobby, or if you are internet savvy and you have seen some major collections online, it might be kind of intimidating, you know, kind of starting out this hobby and not really knowing a lot, but also not having a lot either. So just setting realistic goals when starting out your collection is extremely important. I think we can all agree that we've all been there as well when starting out our collections, when we were a kid, seeing some other people's collections when we got a little bit older or maybe going to shows and you're like, wow, like I'll never have that. You know, I'll never have a collection this big or, or something like that. You're trying not to compare yourself to other collectors if they are in your life or if you venture out and do see some other collectors. Just again, just start small and just start realistic we've kind of touched on this a little bit before but um for your collection um you know if you start big like whether you inherit a big collection or if you start small whether you continue in this hobby or not it's really important that you collect what you like um you'll see a bunch of people especially us sometimes you know talking about this player or that player as far as like maybe not the biggest investment in the world, but just some players that are hot right now or some players that are cold. Um, but it's important that you collect what you like in this hobby because if you get so hung up on collecting the next big thing or collecting this player that's super hot right now, sometimes the value isn't all there. Um, and so you might be disappointed if your player is very well liked today and maybe not liked too much tomorrow in the hobby you know, when it comes to popularity and things like that and value. So just collect what you like. And honestly, uh, you'll never have a bad day in this hobby if you collect what you like because it's yours. And if you like it, then that's all you need. As far as the monetary values of cards, um, this might be something that you are familiar with. It might be something that you're not familiar with, but I would recommend uh, not treating cards as currency, at least not right away. I mean, when I first found out that cards were worth something it was really really cool but i had been thankfully well versed in the hobby uh, before that so i didn't go too crazy with it but i can only imagine if you're a young collector so focused on value right away it might be very very discouraging to find out that you know your cards are worth maybe not as much as you thought so um this kind of pulls back to collecting what you like um, if you collect what you like and you find out that your cards might not be worth as much as you thought, it's not that big of a deal. And if you do want to treat your cards as currency, if you want to start buying and selling, that's totally okay. But at least right away, just try to have fun with it. And then from there, if you do want to start buying and selling, um, you at least have a good handle on this hobby first uh, to give you a really good foundation. I touched on this earlier, but just... Um, you know, you're going to find a lot of other collectors that that's the beauty of this hobby, especially as we as, you know, podcast hosts try to give you advice uh, in starting out this hobby. There's a lot of good people in, the, in this hobby, um, a lot of people that are going to collect stuff that you don't collect, but there's going to be collectors that do collect the same thing as you. So try not to be jealous of other people's collections. Chances are you're going to have some cool stuff that they need and they're going to have some stuff that you need as well. So maybe instead of feeling jealousy and burning some bridges, just try to be befriend some collectors and maybe make a couple of trades with them. So um, that's always some good advice there. So that's all kind of I have just as far as getting your feet wet in this hobby and kind of how to go about that. So if you have any more questions, uh, definitely let us know.
Yeah, and just to add to that, I would say um, as far as the collect what you like, I would say the best way of doing that is just collect your favorite team or if you have a, a favorite player on that team or on any team, you know, start out with that. Maybe you get the, the team set from each base product, things like that. Um, if you end up going the player route, you could maybe even, like Aaron said, start small, start with something attainable, say, okay, I like Connor McDavid. Okay, cool. Obviously, you're not as a kid or really as anybody going to super call it Connor McDavid. So that's literally impossible. But yeah. So maybe you say, okay, I want to get every base card of his every single year. You know, obviously not all of his rookie cards, but just his base cards from 16, 17 on. I want to get one copy of each of those base cards. It's something you know, fairly easy to do. It's something very affordable to do. And it's an attainable but concrete goal for you to go after. And then another thing too, that I've done in the past when I was little is say you're collecting a player and you do something like that. I mean, obviously you, your natural drive as a kid is just to get as much, you know, of, of that person as you can. But if you have it focused on something like the base cards or get insert cards or whatever it might be, then maybe like treat yourself and say, okay, I want to get, you know, one nice autograph card of this guy, or I want to get three Jersey cards of him or something like that, where you're still adding something of, of decent quality to, to your collection, but not making that the main focus because then you're really able to just enjoy those types of cards a lot more if you're kind of more focusing on the generic stuff, but then you do acquire something really nice, you're probably going to enjoy it a lot more than if you had a lot of those cards, because then it would just feel like another card. Oh, for sure. For sure. hundred percent. I agree. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, really the biggest thing is just starting small. You have to make sure you're enjoying it. Um, if you're getting so tied up in the value and you know, oh, this person that I know has more cards than I do or whatever it may be, you're probably not going to have as much fun as you could or should be having. So, you know, definitely just focus on what you can do and, and what's attainable for you. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a hobby. So if you're not having fun, then kind of what's the point? <laughs> so Exactly, exactly. Yeah, just enjoy it and take it a day at a time and try to learn more as you go. I think that's a, a pretty big component of growing in the hobby you know regardless of how old you are is just always trying to learn more about cards and about products and the manufacturers and and things like that always try to be learning something new you know whether it be okay I don't know much about panini cards from the early 2010s so I'm going to go on YouTube and just watch a bunch of box breaks of panini products and just learn more that way you know YouTube is definitely a great resource for seeing cards you know and that's definitely something i would recommend you know you can definitely go on places like ebay or something to see cards as well but that you know obviously is tied to value so you're you might get a little discouraged about oh i think that's a really cool card but there's no way i can afford to buy that but yeah i mean being able to watch box breaks and see people's collections on youtube i think is a really good way of just expanding your awareness within the hobby and and learning more about products and things like that I mean, like we've said, you just have to make sure you're enjoying it. Start small, set some achievable goals. I mean, that's very important that it's achievable. If you set a huge goal right out of the gate and then, you know, you're not making progress on it, you're probably going to get discouraged and you might stop collecting. So make sure it's something achievable and makes sense. You know, it's something that you're going to enjoy doing. You know, I, when I was a little kid, I started collecting in 2003 and I believe the first box I ever opened was 2003 or 4 Upper Deck Classic Portraits. So, you know, just by having that connection with the product, by opening a box, I said, you know, I want to collect the set. So maybe that means, you know, in this day and age, you open a box of, you know, 2021 Upper Deck Series 1 when it comes out in November. And you say, I like this. This was fun. I want to collect the whole set, you know, including all the young guns. Like, I think that's a, a really good way to start. And obviously, like we've mentioned in the past, that helps diversify your collection too. You know, obviously, even though it can be really fun collecting your favorite team or player, it is nice to get a, different cards, you know, of different teams and players that might not interest you a whole lot. But just by having cards of those teams and players, it's going to help grow your knowledge in the game and in the hobby as well. So yeah, I think um, that pretty much 
concludes my thoughts on. Is there anything else you want to add, Aaron? Oh, yeah, just some uh, closing thoughts from me quickly. Um, I really love this hobby, and this hobby is it's meant a lot to me for a long time. Again, since I was a kid, and then I took a little bit of break, and then I kind of got back into it full throttle. This hobby is very unique, uh, especially in today's uh, environment. Uh, with, you know, with the prices going going pretty nuts right now, um, is that 90% of the hobbies that are in, you know, your life, you're not going to see any money back from it. You know, if you're really into like health and fitness or something and you join a gym, you know, you've been joining a gym for a couple of years, um, you, you know, you pay your membership and then that's it. You know, you get out of it, whatever you get out of it. Um, but for card collecting, it's such an interesting hobby that um, you know, you, you know, there is a monetary component as well, a financial component for sure. But the most interesting thing is, especially again, in today's environment, is that there is such a focus financially on cards right now. And cards are commanding huge values that we haven't seen a spike like this in such a long time, if ever. So it's a very cool time to get involved in the hobby. And I know there is a lot of new people coming in right now that maybe haven't collected at all in their lives, or maybe they're coming back after you know uh, a break of 10 or 20 years um, is that you know it is a very very enjoyable hobby uh, and there is a financial component if you were to rip open a box of cards or a pack of cards um, you do kind of in the back of your mind do want to know you know how much is this cards worth but you know it is important that Eric you touched on this that at the end of the day no matter what happens this is still a hobby and as fun as it is to see that, you know, the cards that you have are worth X amount of dollars. The, the goal at the end of the day should be that you're having fun. And we can't stress that point enough. Um, I think there's been times where, um, you know, this is probably for another episode that we've been maybe frustrated with the hobby or just kind of um, worn down by it a little bit. Uh, and so if you do want to start collecting cards, it's very enjoyable, but just try and keep it as as simple as possible to start and then just slowly learn from there it's not a race with this hobby uh it's definitely one that you can have um for your entire life so um like those are just kind of my closing thoughts there so yeah it's a fun topic yeah absolutely and like you mentioned this goes for you know adults that are new to collecting as well or or are maybe coming back to the hobby after an extended break you know just because you know the the title of the podcast it has to do with kids but you know, the same principles are going to apply to any new collector. You know, obviously, if you're an adult, you might have a higher budget for your collecting than a kid might, but the same general principles are still going to apply in that case as well. Definitely. Um, and now for questions, um, if you are new to the hobby, um, make sure to ask as many questions as you possibly can, whether there's a YouTube channel you like or, or even a podcast that you like that discusses cards like this one feel free to ask questions if you don't know something and um, you'll definitely get some answers from more seasoned uh, collectors um, for our podcast listeners every week we just have a rundown of some questions do you feel that the hobby is still attainable for kids uh, why or why not um, also if you think that there is enough in the hobby already for kids to collect is there enough products out there that appeal to kids why or why not you think that is and which carryover rookies from 2021 MVP are you most excited for? Just like every week, um, we'll be posting these questions on our various social media accounts. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Yeah, so that should do it for episode 12. Please be sure to follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Center Ice Cardcast and on Twitter at Center Ice CC. Please also be sure to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice to make sure you never miss a future episode. Until next time on Center Ice Cardcast, keep collecting those hockey cards.